OK, so what we did up until now, we looked at, in, in rather kind of like good depth, looked at different stability criteria. We looked at the Nyquist criteria, which we, criterion which we can actually use for linear system, and then we saw its generalization as circle, an off-axis circle criterion for looking at a general system and seeing if it's something is stable or not. But now, a lot of systems that we deal with may not have some of those pathological behaviors that we discussed and we spent time about, uh, time, time on trying to understand. So what if you have a system where you have a regular feedback loop and then you have some A and you have some F and let's say it's like a mostly linear system and we understand what we should be looking at. And in these situations, and let's say you have a body plot that's kind of a well-behaved body plot, meaning that you have something that does behave, has some sort of a decaying amplitude, and have some sort of a phase behavior that doesn't do anything funny in the sense that it allows for those like conditionally stable things that we've looked at. Now, in those conditions, if those are the case, then there are certain metrics that are useful for analyzing the circuit in more simpler terms. In particular, phase margin and gain margin. So we are going to be talking about how they apply. In, 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 it's a lot of practical situations may involve these, but it's important to know what the general thing is before you jump into it. So if you see some of those pathological cases, you can identify them. But let's say you have an amplifier that's like this. It hits unity gain. So this is a gain of 1 or 0 dB. And at this point, you say, look, you know, if, I, if I, my phase is not doing anything crazy before that, if it's not going into the negative territory, the amount how far I am away from the phase of negative 180, which is the, the, the put, prop, place where I could potentially have a problem, not necessarily, is my phase margin. And you can say, you know, at the point where my phase actually crosses the 180, how much my gain is lower than 1, this is my gain margin. So you essentially saying that if I want to make sure that when I'm getting to a phase of 180, which basically means that the signal that goes comes back around in, in phase because of the negative sign in the feedback loop, I want to have smaller, gain smaller than 1. And how much smaller than 1 it is, that's what we call a gain margin. And then the phase at the point where my gain becomes 1, the unity gain point, how, how far I am from the, that phase of potentially problematic phase of negative 180 is a is my gain, is my phase margin, right? So my phase margin really is defined as the phase of the omega unity minus 180. Oh, I'm sorry, 180 minus the phase of that. 180 plus the phase of that, sorry. This is the phase margin because it's a negative phase, so it would be that much. Okay, so that's my phase margin. Right? So if that's my phase margin then, then the question is, um, what is, wh why is it useful? Is it useful for something? Can it give me some sort of a practical measure? Well, at this point, right, what we know, this is basically the magnitude of the loop gain, right? This is the magnitude of A of J omega F, right, in our system. The magnitude, so at this point, Right? We know that this magnitude is 1, so let's call this omega 1 or omega unity. The question is, can we say something about the behavior of the closed loop system? Because I know my closed loop system is, has a transfer function that's A over 1 plus AF, or A over 1 plus T. And I want to determine, we want to determine what this closed loop transfer function, H of J omega, at around that omega unity looks like. Because if you remember, we said the closed loop system, when the loop gain is large, would produce the H infinity, which is 1 over F in this case. Right? And when the loop gain is very small, would just simply produce just A. Right? Now, but in between, it can do interesting things. And what happens in this, in this between, in the transition point, is what matters to us. And that's why we are interested in seeing what it does in this range. So let's find out. Let's find out what happens in this case. And it's a pretty straightforward thing to do. So if you look at this, you say, okay, what's the magnitude of A of A or F A of J omega? And what is its phase, omega unity? So the magnitude is 1 at that point, right? And the phase is clearly, so the phase 
of f a of j omega is phase margin minus 180 degrees. Or you can write it as a pi in radians, which is a better way of writing it anyway. Um, so if I want to show, so this is something with a magnitude of unity magnitude and some phase. So I can clearly show it as an e to the power of the, the phase, right? j power of phase, f a of j omega, which is e to the power of j phi m times e to the power of negative j pi. And this one clearly is negative 1. So it's negative e to the j phi m. So if that's the case, then the transfer function itself at that frequency, so the transfer function at that frequency, it simply can be written in the following form. So now the other thing is that I can multiply and divide by f. So I can write it as a f over 1 plus a f. Right? And at that frequency, and this is h infinity, right? So you can write it as h infinity, the asymptotic transfer function. And this becomes what? This is this quantity, right? This is the quantity that you have. You know the magnitude. So OK, let's write it as just a f. And then the denominator is going to be 1 minus e to the j phi m. Now, what we are interested in is the magnitude of this thing. We want to see, if, for example, if it overshoots, something happens. So I said, say, if this is magnitude squared, this is going to be h infinity magnitude squared. And then this guy, what is the magnitude of this guy? The magnitude of this guy is simply 1 at that frequency. So this becomes 1 divided by, now the magnitude of this. You can write this as cosine and sine. So you can write it as 1 minus cosine of phi m plus j sine of phi m magnitude squared. So what we have is h infinity squared divided by this magnitude squared, which is going to be the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared, right? Which is what? The real part squared is 1 squared plus cosine of phi m squared plus sine of phi m squared. That gives you another 1. So you get 2 minus 2 cosine of phi m. So, so you get 2 times 1 minus cosine of phi m. Uh, not squared, just that. So, and this is approximately, if you ex write the expansion of the cosine, right? Taylor series expansion of cosine is 1 minus phi m squared over 2 factorial, et cetera, et cetera. So if I keep the first term in the Taylor series expansion, we'll get that this is going to be h infinity divided by phi m squared, approximately. So it says something interesting. And this is really in radians now. It has to be in radians. So it says that the magnitude of h of j omega at the, the omega unity is going to be the h infinity scaled by 1 over phi m, approximately. This is an approximation because of that Taylor series expansion. So it says around here. There is some peaking happening, right? And how much? By 1 over phi m in radians. You remember that was kind of the Q of the peaking, right? The, the amount of peaking was proportional to Q. So what is phi m? So if I want to write it in degrees, so if I want to convert it to degrees, then basically it would be h phi times, it would be whatever, 180 degrees divided by pi roughly divided by phi m in degrees. This is like 55 or something like that degrees. So if you have a phase margin of, let's say, 55 degrees, 60 degrees, then the peaking is not going to be large, right? Because the amount of peaking that you get is about, I mean, this is close to a factor of 1. But as your phase margin becomes smaller, you get more and more peaking. Which also means that in time domain, the response is going to be more and more underdamped. So for example, if your phase margin is 90 degrees, your step response will look like that. Something like that. Right? You have a phase margin of 60 degrees, and you get something that looks more like that. It does 
peak up a little bit, and then one eventually comes back. So that's like phi m of 60 degrees. And then if you have a phi m phase margin of uh, 45 degrees, then you get something like this. So phase margin for systems that don't have those funny subtleties that we discussed extensively is a good measure of how much of an underdamped response you may get. So you can use it as a way of thinking about the response of the system in general. Now, we got to be careful, and I mentioned this, we mentioned this before, we discussed this briefly, but again, I want to emphasize that, that the fact that you, the closed loop transfer function, the magnitude of h of j omega, can be actually misleading in terms of what you see. So there are situations, for example, we saw that you can have more gain. So if, if you had a system like this, and if you looked at, looked at the loop gain, and let's say your loop gain was negative 2. If your loop gain was negative 2 and you had a phase behavior that was like this, from the Nyquist uh, plot, you know that you're crossing this at negative 2. right? So this is one of the points on that plot. And if you don't, if you have kind of monotonic phase and amplitude, is it stable or unstable from a Nyquist perspective? This is unstable from any perspective, from a circle perspective, off-axis circle perspective, all of those things, right? This is unstable. Right. So now, but look at this, the transfer function of the system. So this is something to be careful about. The h of s or h, uh, j omega, or h in general, is going to be, so h of j omega, is going to be a of j omega divided by 1 minus 2, which is going to be minus a of j omega. Right? You get something. It's not blowing up. It's not going to infinity. So if you do a Bode plot of this thing, like we saw last time, you may get something like that for the closed loop system. So the phase margin, I would say the Bode plot of the closed loop system may not clearly indicate to you that your system is unstable. We're just looking at that. And if you have this Nyquist plot, this system is not stable. We know that. So we have to be careful because you're looking at two completely different things. One is the transfer function from this input to this output when the loop is closed. The other one is the transfer fun function from this input to this output when there's no input. And they show very different things. So you have to be careful what you're looking at when you're trying to evaluate these things. So, but regardless of that, what happens is that phase margin and gain margin properly used and if understood correctly in the context of a more broad definition, nonlinearity criteria, are useful things. And we'll use them in design all the time. You make an amplifier, say, well, this is my phase margin, this is my gain margin, but you have to understand that there are these higher level subtleties that we discussed when we talked about Nyquist and nonlinear. Uh, properties. So what we'll do next is take these criteria and use them for st stabilizing and define changing the circuit. So now we're going to go back to circuit next, circuits, and look at several different circuit schematics and see how we can actually apply methods of stabilizing sta uh, based on these concepts that we developed. Okay. Any questions? Oh, okay. So that, then you really need to think about how the Nyquist looks like. Because, so that's a good question. You say if you have multiple crossover points, you mean like the, in, the, in the magnitude plot? Yeah, so, so that again, so if you have something that does this, right? What you need to really look at is see, okay, what is my Nyquist plot doing? Because that's what your Nyquist plot is doing. The margins, yeah, I mean, if you're in that, in those situations, you can do one of two things. You can say, okay, I'll pick the worst case scenario and try to optimize for, or design for that. The, the one that gives me the most conservative approach. And you could do that. Or you could say, I'm going to go back. Now you have to go back to the full criteria, full set of criteria, which is basically like the Nyquist or circle criteria. And look at that and see what that tells you. So those, that's exactly why we study those things, to know what to do in those scenarios. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Okay. Thanks.